We are going to pray right now. Father, we recognize that without your Spirit, there's nothing we could do. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit. You are the God who is present. You are the one who our Master Jesus said is going to teach us all truth. You will lead us and you will guide us. That's what our Lord Jesus told us. So we welcome you, Spirit of God, because we recognize that our eyes need to be open to the things of God. We, our hearts need to be ready to receive the seed that comes from you, Spirit of God. We need to prepare our hearts that we will be in, humble in spirit so that we'll never think we know, we really know everything. Reveal to us, Holy Spirit, because you are the God of revelation. Reveal to us things that concerns our walk with you. We have prayed just now that we might live a life that is pleasing to you. But Lord, sometimes we don't know how. And when we know how, sometimes we don't have that motivation. But Lord, we do want to please you. We come as people who are carnal in thinking. We seek your help to change our thinking. Because Lord, without changing the, our minds, there's no way we can progress. So, Father, this book of Romans seems a bit too deep for many of us. And sometimes we wonder whether it's worth grappling with it. But Lord, you said in your word that all scripture is given by inspiration of you, Holy Spirit. You are the one who inspires. You are the one who is the author. Therefore, we come humbly, Holy Spirit, and ask that you will Open our eyes and show us wondrous things out of your word. Lord, we cannot depend on a speaker, nor can we depend on the arm of flesh. So we depend on you, Spirit of God, to speak to us as we open our hearts to you, so that, Lord, by the end of this sermon, we know that you have spoken to us individually. Speak to us, Lord, because there's a lot of confusion regarding our election, our future destiny. Too many voices, too many opinions. But Father, let your Spirit now reveal to us what is on your heart this morning. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today you will see that God is, has many things to tell us about himself. You know, Romans is a very important book because God is revealing things which previously we did not know. Uh, and one of the revelations uh, that he has shown is that he is not only a God of love, but a God of wrath. Because he is very angry with sinful behavior. So if you've got your, your notes, uh, I'm going to run through quickly a few key points here, and then I'm going to explain using my mind map uh, to give you a background. Okay. So in your notes, you'll find a quick summary of a few things that uh, this passage is referring to. Uh, it's about how God feels. My theme today is about how God feels. How do you feel this morning? Uh, happy? Um, I don't know how you feel, but this morning we are going to look at how God feels. Okay, now, it is written, there is no one righteous. No one. Underline this word, no one. That's how God feels. Is it really no one? Today, maybe you will be one of them. But God feels there's no one. 
Not even one. Because one is so important to God. You are the one that is so important to God. It makes a difference that you are the one that will be righteous. But God said, this is just how he feels. No one. There is no one. In short phrase, already three times, no one, no one, no one. And then fourth time, no one. No one understands. No one seeks. No one righteous. No one understands. No one seeks. What is God saying? This is how I feel. That no one, no one understands. That if you today say, Lord, I want to be one of those who will understand what is upon your heart. Then I think that would be a very good response. And today, you say, God, you told us no one. But I'll be one to represent my right generation to seek you. I'll be the one. Because you said you have no one. I'll be the one. So the general theme of uh, Romans is revelation of God's righteousness. It's about righteousness. He's revealing to us the secrets of righteousness. And Paul has been trying to reveal it because when he wrote this, he prayed. He never stopped praying and never stopped giving thanks for the Roman Christians. Have you ever given thanks for other Christians here, for people you have led to the Lord, for those around you who have trusted the Lord. Have you ever given thanks? Paul was like that. He prayed and he gave thanks. So if you have been praying for this church and giving thanks, you are more or less doing what Paul has done. Then he said he was obligated to preach, to teach. Do you feel this obligation? Do you know that this obligation is upon each one of us? And if you feel the way Paul feels, hey, I'm obligated, you know. I'm the most talented Hebrew scholar around here. Therefore, I'm obligated. God has blessed me so much. I'm obligated. Hey, I'm one of the top students in my class. Therefore, I'm obligated to help others in my class. Obligated to preach. Are you able to see the words right at the back? Eager to preach. That's why God asked him to deliver the message. If you are eager to preach, God wants to use you and work with you to preach. As a teenager, one day after coming to know the Lord, Few year, a year after coming to church, I told the Lord, I'm eager to preach. Uh, you may say, wow, you think you're so bold. No, no, I just have the desire that one day I want to preach the word of God. And uh, 65 years have passed. I'm still preaching. But the environment is very different. The Roman Empire has characterized by depravity and one of the most common thing was incestuous behavior. Even Nero, when Paul wrote this letter, Nero was the fourth year of his emperorship and uh, he was in an ancestral relationship. It seems with his mother. It's very terrible. And uh, incest is so common. I find it so revolting when I read in the papers father had been having sex with his daughter. Do you get angry when you read this kind of thing? It's happening in Singapore. And then it happened in Rome. And this is the environment. But Paul is convinced that the power of the gospel is enough to change things. So what must we do to be saved from sinful behavior. And the first thing you need to recognize in my notes here is the condemnation 
of the godless. This is the first thing. We know about the wrath of God. When God is angry, because God is angry, he has condemnation for godless behavior. And two weeks ago I explained what is godless behavior. Godless behavior is uh, denying his existence and treating him as if he does not exist. Who is guilty of this? Christians who say they believe in Jesus. If you live a life as if God never exists, you never consult him. Your reading Bible is a chore. You never thought what God thinks about every action you have taken. Uh, then you are godless. This morning, our worship leader led us to take a moment to consider in what way have we offended God that we fail to shine as light in the darkness. That we took a minute to confess our sin. So I took a minute to confess my sin. But the moment you, every, every moment you have lived without considering what God thinks about what you're going to do, then I say to you, you are a godless Christian. A godless Christian and a godless non-Christian is the same as far as God is concerned. Treating God as if he doesn't exist. This is godliness, godlessness. Okay, so there are a few things God feels throughout the book of Romans. The first thing is that he, we don't understand the extent of our sin and how it caused the heart of God to be painful. Second, we have this, covered this in the first session, that godlessness is manifested by a refusal to glorify him as God. That means we do not honor him in our thinking, our behavior, our conduct. We are not giving glory to God. We do a lot of things, but it's all me first. What do I get out of it? Not what God gets out of it. So we fail to glorify God. That's why this form of godlessness is very offensive. God is angry when we do things without glorifying Him. Because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Your light of the world is through your good works to glorify your Father in heaven. You didn't do so. That's godlessness. And then we are oblivious. God is sad that we don't understand the dire consequences of hell for those who reject God. This is a problem. We underestimate the risk of ending in hell. Why? Because we are told we are Christian one. As a Christian, I can sin against God, I'll get to heaven. Non-Christian cannot sin. If they sin, they go to hell. Is that so? Romans God says the same. A godless Christian and a godless non-Christian ends up in the same place. This is why God is angry, that we are oblivious of the consequences. Then lastly, God give them up. We don't realize that. There comes a point when God will give us up if we are stubbornly carrying on a life of godlessness. So, and hell is the worst place that anyone could end up when God gives us up. But God hasn't given you up yet if you are still saying, Lord, I want to serve you. I want to worship you. I will obey you. If that's what you are saying, then your destiny is not hell. But God says, we need to understand consequences. All right. So this is what we have covered. Then one of the things we saw that God was 
unhappy about is that we uh, do two things when God judges. When God judges, he does, he focuses on two elements. One, those who seek his glory, that means those who seek to glorify him, to honor him, and to seek immortality. That means you are seeking eternal life. Life in heaven. Life with Jesus. If this is what you are looking for, and it means a lot to you, then God says, don't worry about the judgment. You'll be fine. You'll have eternal life. But God says, those who are self-seeking, self-serving, self-worship, ah, there's wrath and anger. So this is how God wants us to understand. This is a summary of what we have covered. Then, today we look at chapter 3, and let me summarize what chapter 3 is. If I read through it, I know some of you have read through it, and you say, I can't, I can't make head or tail what chapter 3 is about. Okay, But it begins with... Uh, uh, A question, four questions. So what are the four questions chapter 3 is looking at? Chapter 3 begins with question 1. Okay, these are questions that sums up how God feels about us. Firstly, what advantage? Ah, okay, that's good. What advantage then has the Jew? Or, what is the profit of circumcision? So that's a question number one. What has that got to do with you and me? He's talking about the Jews. But is the Jews have, in the days of, these are Jewish Christians. By the way, G, uh, Paul is talking to Christians. He's not talking to non-Christians. What advantage has the Jewish Christian against others? Or, in the modern context, what is the advantage of you who is a Christian who knows the Bible more than others? Because every week you're receiving teaching, you're learning a lot of things. Very few of you don't even realize how much you've learned every 12 months. Okay? And of course, you don't know how many man hours have been put in to get every sermon out, every outline out, every mind, 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 uh, mind map out. Uh, you don't realize how much you know. You know a lot. And you have an advantage. What advantage have you? You have a great advantage. Because you know more than most. You know what God's law says. You know how God is going to behave. Uh, how God feels. You, you read it all in the scriptures. You're all instructed. Week after week. And you have small group discussions. And we spend time trying to find out what is upon God's heart. So you know a lot, a lot, a lot. But is that an advantage? Yes. In fact, in a way, it's an advantage. But on the whole, if you know a lot, but you do very little, then you have no advantage. You can end up same place as everybody else. So if you have been a long-time Christian, you have a mentor, you've got mothers who teach you the Word of God, you've got good cell leaders ah, in your family, you have family time, wow, you have an advantage. To the Jews, they have a lot of advantage. First of all, they need no translation. The first 2,000 years of church in the world history, everybody speaks Hebrew. No other language, only Hebrew. So if you speak Hebrew, Shalom, uh, then you are among the majority in the first 2,000 years of Earth's history. But today, you know the language of God's love. You know the language of God's anger. You know all this language. You speak Zion language. You know, 
words like salvation. When I was a teenager, I first came to church, one group of young people surrounded me. Everyone asked me, hey, brother, you got salvation or not? I said, I got $5, but I, I got no salvation. Right? I, because I didn't know what salvation meant. Everybody asked me, salvation, salvation. Nobody explained to me what was salvation. And it took me a year before I really found out what is the word salvation. But you know about salvation. And uh, you do have the oracles of God. That means you have the scriptures. All of you have. And then you have an advantage. Make use of it. But you, it's no advantage when you stand before the judgment seat of God because you know but you never do. That's then become a disadvantage. Question number two. Uh, for what if some did not believe? Will their belief make faithfulness of God without effect? Well, uh, it says certainly not. So, there are some Bible scholars who say the Bible is not true. People like Bart Erdman, PhD for study of Greek, and uh, he claims he knows the Bible. He didn't know the Bible because the Old Testament is in Hebrew. He only knows Greek. Yeah. And he says, I don't believe. I don't believe that's correct. I, I don't believe the Bible is authentic. Uh, I don't believe this. I don't believe. So what? Do you listen to people who claim they don't believe just because they got the title doctorate behind their names? We also got a few people with doctorate behind their names, but, uh, but they're okay here. BC one is okay. <laughs> but the thing is this. Those big guns who call themselves, who are famous celebrities, people who have Bible background, who says they don't believe. Do you know the worst atheists in the world are all had Bible background? Do you know that people like uh, Darwin used to study the Bible for three years to become a priest? I think he didn't get the job, so he decided to be a priest for the devil. Uh, so he used to go to church. Richard Dawkins, up to recently, the number one atheist, he used to grow up in church in South Africa. You've got people like Karl Marx, which are the communist countries are following. He grew up knowing the Bible. He was, a, he, he knew, he spoke Hebrew. Right? He was a Jew. So plenty of these people around. And they, sometimes you say, oh, oh but they, not everybody believe. So what? Do you believe? So you don't get influenced by it. Question number three. Is God unjust? Just because, just because, my uh, unrighteousness give God an opportunity to show His righteousness. That music is not from heaven. Uh, so, sometimes we, as you read this, you can't make figure out what is all this. Yeah, there are many situations where bad things turn good because it brought glory to God. Okay, the simplest story I can explain to you is something like uh, uh, Ruth. Ruth was in a very bad situation. Uh, and then, but what's the final outcome of Ruth? She married Boaz. And then, who is Boaz? And who is Ruth? Uh, King David's great grandmother. And oh, what about Jesus? Yes, without Ruth, there is no Jesus. Do you realize that? So do you say, therefore, if I if I go and do more bad things, God will get more glory. Uh, if I do more sin, uh, God can show more grace. This kind is a crazy logic. So some Christians say, uh, I'm under grace. I, uh, yeah, I'm sinful. I commit adultery, but I'm told that it's okay. The more sin you commit, the more God is gracious. This kind of logic, he say, is 
misunderstanding or an excuse. But the question four, for if the truth of God is increased through my lying and his glory, why am I also judged as a sinner? So, uh, then the truth of God has increased through my lie. That means the more lies I do, God's righteousness can be demonstrated. You can see contrast. Therefore, I shouldn't be judged for my sin. I know some of you find it. What's the logic behind it? Well, don't ask me. Some people have that logic. So there's roughly four questions. that. But overall, Christians have excuses. Mostly, every Christian thinks they are on the way to heaven. Forgetting that they are the elect. They're on the way, yes, but you must stay on the way. So, in this Gospel of Romans, Paul is trying to explain that in this journey to, of faith, the first thing you need to recognize is God's anger against godlessness. All these issues are godless logic. Okay? So, uh, if you don't, can't figure out what it all means, simply this. That if you are a Christian, you have an advantage because you know the will of God. But it becomes a disadvantage if you pay no attention to practice. You never do what you preach. Then it becomes a disadvantage because you'll be judged more severely. All right. But if you carry out what you learn and you do what you preach, you are at an advantage. You are not hate for. You'll never end up in hell. So that makes it very straightforward. All right, now. Today, my key presentation would be on this 9 to, um, 9 to 20. But I'm going to read this passage and then see whether you can make sense out of it because some people find that it doesn't make sense. Uh, they say words, words, and more words. But I like to anchor this whole thing under what God says. Okay, I don't know what's your version. Is your version Chinese or English or Hebrew or New Living Letter, NLT or ABC or KJV? Never mind. Uh, just follow what I'm reading here. Okay. So from verse 9 is what I'm going to preach on today. Having told you why, why God was angry about. But today, let's read what it says here and then try to make sense of it. It begins with what then? So after all these arguments that I just reviewed to you, I just done a revision from the past two weeks, three weeks, and then he says, what then? So what's the conclusion? What are we heading for? Are we better than they? Not at all, for we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. So we know all are under sin. As it is written, every time you find the Bible, as it is written, it's talking about the Old Testament. And here, Paul, under inspiration, is quoting verbatim from five passages in the Old Testament. And he begins with quoting part of Psalms. And most of it come from Psalms. Part of it come from the prophet Isaiah. So he cobbled all this uh, poetry together. Now, first thing you need to take note, when it's in this kind of a form, what do we call it? We don't call it prose. The Bible is either prose or poetry, all right? So the poetry is in this kind of format. You know, you don't have, uh, whereas here, a story like this, this is prose, all right? So you need to differentiate between these two. So the moment it comes to poetry, you don't try to learn a lot of facts from it. It is about feelings. 
about how God feels about us. It's not to teach you doctrine. It's to teach you how God feels. That's what I want you to know. This is how God feels. Can you see the change? God said, I'm very angry because you are godless. You are unrighteous. You treat me like uh, uh, I never exist. But now God is changing his tone. He is telling you how he feels. Now he says, there is none righteous. There is none righteous. Is that okay? There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues, their practice, deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Then he goes on one more sentence. In the, and the new way, and the way of peace, the way of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And then he sums up what is going to happen. Okay, I've got it all in your notes, but uh, you go and read for yourself. I just run through a few things here. Um, for instance, um, I want to focus on para 3. So if you've got your notes for para 3, that will help you to follow what I'm going to preach on. I summarize it as God's grief for his created and chosen ones. If you have trusted Jesus, you are his chosen people. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Uh, so you are chosen. You have not chosen me, God said, but I've chosen you that you will go and bring forth fruit. So you are chosen ones. So Romans 3, 10 to 18 is written in poetry, okay? Underline this. So Paul is not talking about learning doctrines. Paul is talking about understanding God's feeling. It expresses God's deep feelings and uh, that he's looking for people he had created and chosen. He's looking for people who seek him, uh, who and seek his glory and immortality. So you underline the word seek. Okay. God's feelings. That will be the key ideas here. So the summary is that God is sharing with us what he's looking for. And he's not finding it. It's just like some of you who uh, have not eaten uh, what, uh, uh, ice cream for a long time. And you say, I look forward to eating ice cream. I know by the looks of it, most of you have already eaten too much ice cream, but uh, so it doesn't mean much. But uh, I have a friend uh, who was in hospital for uh, for five months. He couldn't eat anything, and he one day told me, "I really, really look for the day I can eat this curry puff that you your wife used to serve." Wow, oh, that's wonderful! I've been thinking for five months how to eat curry puff, but I couldn't eat curry puff. Uh, because I'm not allowed to eat. My system inside, my stomach is koya. I, I mean, uh, what's the word for koya? Uh, not functioning. Uh, okay. So, it's something like that, you know. Ah, I, I, I look forward to it. So, that's how good, what God is looking for. So, from this, I, I give you four things here. Godly people, is first thing what God is looking for, not godless people. So you got your notes. Secondly, God is looking for uh, four kinds of characteristics for godly people. Okay, uh, and uh, people who understands Him. What are godly people? So God is looking for these kind of people, and you say, Lord, I want to be the godly people that you are looking for. I don't want to be a godless person. All right. Then the following criteria will apply. 
it will be people who understand Him, understand His heartbeat, understand what is upon His heart. So I summarize a few things here. Delights in Him, understands Him, and then I try to give the word understand. Do you know one of the things you ever pray for your disciples under you? What is the first thing that uh, you pray for them? When I was a new Christian, I had a mentor and he gave me a present, a New Testament. And uh, he wrote in the beginning, he said, this is what I'm praying for you. And he quotes Colossians 1, verse 9 to 11. So I look up, what is this verse? It says, Paul is saying to the Colossian Christians, from the first day I heard of your faith, I cease not to pray for you. That means I never stop praying for you. And what do I pray for you? That you'll be filled with the wisdom of God, with spiritual understanding. That you will have spiritual understanding. That means you'll be filled with understanding of the things in the spiritual realm regarding God. And uh, that you'll be filled with wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, God always yearns for people who understand Him. And so He wrote in the sad days of Israel, our prophet Jeremiah wrote, God said through Jeremiah and Jeremiah chapter 9, He said, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the strong man glory in his might. And so on and so on. But let him who wants to glory, glory in this, that he understands. He knows me and understands me. You know, God longs for us to understand him. That's what the kind of godly people that you are striving to understand. When you come here this morning and you say, Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to, I, I see nothing in it. I read 50 times already. The more I read, the more confused. What is all this about? Well, God says, I'm looking for people who understand my heart. And King David, although he was also a sinful man, but God said, he strived to understand my heart. He's a man after my own heart. You know, that is the greatest compliment you'll ever have when you stand before the throne of grace to say, son, daughter, you have understood my heart. And for you, because you understand my heart, judgment becomes not serious issue anymore. That's the kind of people I'm looking for. Understand me. And secondly, he says, those who seek Him, God always so eager for us to look for Him so that He says, those who seek Me will find Me. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking because the door will be open. What He's trying to say, I'm very eager to, to be found by you, but can you seek Me or not? Can you seek me in the morning? Can you seek me in the night? Can you seek me? Seek his kingdom and his righteousness first as priority. Ah, if you are seeking God as a priority, I say to you, you are a godly person because of what you seek. You did not seek to be rich or famous. You seek his face. Because you know that if you know Him, you will become like Him, a God of holiness, a God of wisdom. Seek Him. We become what we seek. What do you really seek in your life? Only you can decide. And if you check your daily life, you'll know what you've been seeking. Most people seek what? Wealth. So the Bible says in Jeremiah 9, Let not the rich man 
glory in his riches. Because everybody looks for riches or might or even wisdom, worldly wisdom. So seeking, what do you seek? And uh, we'll find him. We'll always find that God is near. God is true. Doesn't matter what you're facing, what negative situation you are in. As long as you seek him, when you find him, you will always be delivered. You will always find blessing in your life. You will always find blessing pouring into your life. Because you seek Him. Seek first. Seek Him first. Don't seek Him last. That's not the seeking that God is talking about. Then the third thing, the fourth thing uh, is uh, talking about doing good. Yeah. Because good works glorify the Father in heaven. Why do you do good works? Because you are good. You are good in the eyes of your Father. Because you are trying to glorify the Father, therefore you are good. So I confess my sin when I take revenge on some people by not serving them. And the Lord spoke to me, is that really good? No, that's not good. You didn't explain to them why you couldn't do what you wanted, you didn't want to do. So goodness is something that flows out of a heart of goodness. And if you are truly one who is godly, you do good. Yeah, it just come out. Words that come out will be good. All because, not because you are trying to be good, but because you are good, that's all. You are not evil, you are good. Therefore, you identify, are you good? From the words you speak and so on, we'll see it later. Okay, so your then lastly, you fulfill God's purpose. Because this passage talks about becoming uh, useless. God doesn't want us to become useless. In this po poem that you have read, God says that because we do not seek Him, we become useless. The word is useless. So NIV says, I think, unprofitable or some other word. But it's useless, meaning like a, a car that's broken down is useless. Or a pen that's broken is useless. Or a watch that's broken, all the, all the hands are missing, it's useless. So we, something becomes of no use at all. So we all become useless people when we are ungodly. When God gives us up, we become useless. So that's what we have covered in the last uh, sermon. So do you know that all of us need to feel useful to be happy? You need to feel you, you need to be useful. Yeah. Ah. Uh, when I was a kid, my mother used to say, if you don't study hard, you'll be bu zong yong in Hainanese. And I wondered, what does that mean? Well, we all grow up, we need to feel we are useful. Back that particularly to God in His kingdom. We need to be feel useful to our society, to our family, to whatever. We are useless. We don't want to be a useless person. Uh, uh, because a useless person cannot do anything. But we are people who are useful because we fulfill God's purpose. Even King David was very useful to God. The Bible says he fulfilled God's purpose in his generation. Hey, young people, do you ever wonder whether you are useful in your generation? I was a new Christian, uh, and uh, so I used to attend this church in Katong, called Bethesda Katong. And then one day I looked around, I said, oh, I, uh, I think I want to 
uh, help uh, my other same age group, young people, to study the word, to be a disciple. Okay, I was a greenhorn. I never did. I was a. Uh, I was first year in poly at that time. I said no. I, I like to do something useful. So I prayed, and then I gathered a few young people in the in the church, and they said, okay, let's go and share the gospel in the neighborhood. And uh, another day, I said, okay, let's learn to study the Bible. Uh, the church didn't authorize me. Nobody authorized me. I just met a few people. It's informal. But the group somehow began to do evangelism, begin to share the word and do disciple making. This group began to grow and grew to 65 people. Then it became a huge group. Oh, I was so delighted. One of the girls that joined this group was a lady called Kim. Wow, I so benefit. Lah. Okay, but I didn't know that time, you see. But she also joined in, and a few other ladies all joined in. And, uh, but the idea I'm trying to share is this. You don't need to be authorized. Because you need to be useful for the kingdom of God. Make yourself useful. It doesn't matter. Particularly if you're on a collegiate, you're very useful. I remember uh, I, in, in the Singapore Poly in those days, we were in Prince Edward Road. We got a group of young people together, collegiate students, and we formed a group called Poly Christian Fellowship. And then we preached the gospel. Uh, so make yourself useful uh, because that is pleasing to God. That's what we call a godly people. I'll give you five things here about what a godly person is. All right. And that pleases God. God says, I long for these people. No one does good. No one is uh, righteous. No one seek after me. No one understand me. Can you respond today to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be the one that will do all these things that pleases you. If that's how you feel, tell the Lord that you please Him so much. That's what is upon His heart. Then secondly, God look for people with godly speech. All right, now. Maybe it's easier if I use my mind map. Uh, so all these notes is reflected here. All right. So, godly speech. So the first three things about godly speech... Uh, This is three things about godly speech that God is looking for from you and me. So, God put in a negative thing. God talked about our throats are a open sepulcher, or NIV, you will use the modern word grave. But sepulcher simply means a grave that is carved into a rock, like the tomb that Jesus is placed in. That, uh, so when you open the tomb, especially if it's only a, a, a week after the burial, you might get a very, very foul smell. Remember, the two sisters that loved Jesus, uh, Mary and Martha, and when Jesus uh, came to the funeral of their brothers, their brother, and uh, Jesus told them, Open the tomb. And the sister objected, says, Lord, uh, by now it's, it's, the order is, uh, the stench will be too strong. Because they hadn't used a lot of herbs, you see. So, what does this Jewish phrase mean? Well, have you ever talked to people who have got bad breath? Well, how long do you, can you talk to people with bad breath? Especially if he stands very close to you. I know swimmers and trainers of swimming like Jonathan will say, very easy, I hold my breath. <laughs> he can hold very long time, you know, three minutes. But you and I cannot do that, right? 
You move away, you feel like uh, that person say, what, well, you think I'm a devil? Uh, then you cause offense. Sometimes very hard, you know. Uh, so you, one solution, learn from Jonathan how to hold your breath. Okay, but that may not solve. But the truth here is this. When you open your mouth, do you get things coming out? Are they wave of fresh or still air? So Paul described it in a different way in Corinthians. He says some of us are a savor of life unto life. Some of us are a savor of death unto death. That means the moment you open your mouth, you share things, but what you do is, uh, you know, it's very negative. It doesn't help anybody. In fact, you may cause somebody to be killed or because you didn't tell the truth or you didn't have anything useful or edifying to share and you are promoting spiritual death. Your words did not bring life. That's why we always pray that God will help us to have the tongue of the learner, that we may know how to speak a word in season to those who are weary. Those throat of sepulchres speak out words that are discouraging. It doesn't help us at all. Negative people. So are you one of those who uh, have a throat of, a, of an open grave? God said he's looking for people who will know how to deal with this kind of cruel behavior. Uh, or is it a poison? Poison here talks about, you know, um, I remember one night when I was first starting BBTC Church and I had one staff with me. This staff is a brilliant guy, but he married a beautiful woman. Uh, but uh, beautiful outside, but very ugly inside. So one morning, 3 a.m. in the morning, he came knocking at my gate at Lucky Heights. Knock, 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 knock. Finally, I woke up. Who is this? Oh, he's my staff, church staff. So I said, what do you, what do you want? I said, I need help. I need help. I said, what help do you need? Oh, my wife chased me out. Uh, she took a scissor and threatened me and, and, uh, and chased me out of the house. Uh, and uh, I had to go to his house and found out that the wife had cut all his ties with the scissor. He was so discouraged. So he said, he's worried about his daughter, about seven, eight years old. He said, you know, I'm so sad. My, my daughter doesn't like me. Hate, she hates me. Because my wife always poisoned her mind against me. Can you see? The poisoning is sharing thoughts that will cause enmity. So this is one of the common things that happens. But God's heartbeat is that we will not be this kind of a person. That every time you share something, you are not poisoning someone attitude towards someone else. Don't be a poisoner. All right. So that's the first thing. I call it words of cruelty. It's very cruel to, to be doing this because you are sending somebody to hell by the words of poisoning. Poisoning people against God. Every time you say something that is not true and says against God, that puts a blame on God, you are poisoning people against God. That's what it happens. Atheists do that all the time. The second thing is uh, creating lies, che cheating, cheating. The, word, the passage says deception, words of deception. So deception are words or actions that is designed to deceive others. Uh, God looks for people who will hate cheating. Well, adultery is a cheating in action. But they are the same as cheating with words that are untrue, particularly words that betray God's faithfulness. 
or actions that betray God's goodness. And uh, cheating, God's heartbeat is cheating hurts him. Especially we cheat God by breaking our covenant with him. Just like a husband and a wife. When a wife cheats on the husband, whether by illicit sex or whether by deception, you are hurting the other party of the covenant. We and God are covenant relationship. So we hurt God a lot when we cheat on Him by worshipping other gods, by deception. Uh, thirdly, cursing. That's the word that God says the lips are full of cursing. Here it is speaking, uh, we are discrediting God by the way we behave and by the way we speak. The whole world use God's name for cursing. Oh my God! Some people talk like that. I find it very offensive. Why do you bring God's name when something bad happened? Or use Jesus' name. Jesus' name is a precious name. We sang that song and we shout the name Jesus. Because the name is above every name and every tongue must confess that he is Lord, he is boss, he is king. Every tongue must confess. One day everyone must confess whether you believe or don't believe. Whether you are atheist or believer, you have to confess Jesus is Lord. But why do you confess his name in a negative situation to express disappointment? Be careful that you do not curse God, His name, by your behavior. In this passage, He says, by your behavior, you have uh, brought disgrace to the name of God. For instance, if I continue living in sin, and, uh, you know, if, it, if, if this is a church full of practicing adulterers, how does that glorify God? Of course, you will never glorify God. It will be a cursing by our action. But instead, we have to bring blessing to the name of God by your behavior. When you conduct yourself with wisdom, when you are able to answer every man's question and ask them if they ask you for the reason for your hope in Christ, ah, that is blessing God. So that's what God, every time we speak cursing, we hurt God's heart. So, um, then it says in this poem about consequences, about destruction, we need to be aware of the consequences of sin. Destruction means ruin. Sin always leads to destruction of your life, your family, and uh, misery. That means you are sad, you are miserable. Not godly sadness, but you are, live a miserable life. And there's no peace. You will not enjoy the peace of God that passes all understanding. So if we are those who cannot understand the level of risk regarding the consequences of living in sin, that displeases God. We, very few Christians, in fact, Christian or non-Christian, we are very bad in what we call risk assessment. One summary in uh, one uh, study showed that uh, they were questioning the adulterers. Why do you do it? Didn't you know 
you live in adultery, you're going to destroy your marriage and your family and your life? And the answer given usually is, yes, I know there's a risk, but I thought the risk is very, very low because I know how to plan it so I won't get caught. Are you sure you can plan it that you'll never get caught? You see, God has got a very funny habit. Uh, I don't know whether you think it's funny or not. The Bible says, your sin will find you out. That means God is actively engaged to expose our sin. The more we hide, the more it comes out. Like King David, he's the king. Who can question him? So when he committed adultery, what did he do? He hide here, hide there. Wow, he's got a lot of plans. Plan number one, plan A, plan B, plan C. He had about three plans. But he couldn't keep any plan because God was exposing it. That's what your sins will find you out. So he went to quite extreme measure to hide, but finally what did God say? God sent a prophet Nathan and told him a long story and bring him about, about a man who was very cruel, who was very rich, but when he had a visitor, he went to the neighbor's house to take the little lamb that belonged to the neighbor and slaughter it and serve it to his guests. And of course, David was hopping mad. He said, who is this man? I'll, I'm going to, I will judge him and send him to, he should die. That's exactly what King David said. But Nathan, the brave prophet, said, you are the man. But thanks be to God that he repented immediately. And God punished him for he had no peace throughout his time. So God is looking for people who will understand the consequences of sin. That your sin will sure to find you out because he is actively exposing it. No way you can hide. But of course, the serious, more final consequences is on the day of judgment. Every one of us have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. Why did you do that? And God is looking for people who will uh, finally cause. God is looking for people who are, so we call these consequences godly foresight. Okay. And uh, we underestimate the severity of consequences against sin. Christian or non-Christian, consequences are the same. And then lastly, godly fear. No fear of God. That's the main cause. Why are we not able to please God? Because we don't fear God. We fear a lot of other things. We fear, you know, recession. We fear COVID. We fear monkey pox. Uh, we fear what, uh, I don't know how many pox there are. <laughs> all kinds. Uh, we fear a lot of things, but we don't fear God. So the fear of God is a beginning of wisdom. All of us know this. What is the fear of God? We say the fear of God has to do with the fact that the day will come when I need to give an account. It is so shameful that I have to give an account for what I've done. But you notice I have the word uh, godly fear. So we need to fear God. In the, if you want to see success in our lives. Do I have another thing to show? Okay. Hold on for a moment. So what is your fear of God? You know, many of us, we uh, don't fear God partly because we think that as long as you say, sorry, sorry, you'll be good enough. After all, the Bible says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins 
cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But we forget that the fear of God has to do with certain sins he'll forgive, certain sins he will not forgive. So you need to understand this. Is from the Old Testament, we see this common misunderstanding about why we don't fear God. Let me ask. So I call it, why Christians believe no judgment? Uh, we, 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 we don't fear God because we, we don't f- believe that there will be judgment. But the Bible says everyone will be judged. But, but we believe also that God, uh, why Christians believe no judgment for intentional sins? Or that means if the sins are intentional, we think that God will still not judge us. You, you know, when we fall into sin, the word of God is very clear. You will confess your sins, God will forgive you on the basis of the finished work of Christ. You all know that, right? But there's a flip side you need to know that the Old Testament Leviticus explained it is for unintentional sins that God will forgive. If it's intentional, it is not forgiven. Now, you say that's Old Testament. But New Testament, does it talk about it? Yes. 1 John 5 says that if any man sin a venial sin, a sin unto death, don't pray for him because God will not forgive. But if it's not a sin that's unto death, then pray for him. Then God will forgive. So this how? So what do you mean by all this? Well, it means that an intentional sin means that you know God will forgive you if you confess your sin. So we do it this way. I will live a life of adultery and uh, excess and I do all the bad things, but don't worry. At the 11th hour, I say, sorry, sorry. Then God will forgive me and I'll walk happily into the kingdom of heaven. Is that true? Most Christians believe that. I just say sorry again already. Because First John 1 9 says so. Is that so? God says, what do you mean by intentional? Intentional means I continue to live a life of sin. God says it's wrong. Uh, I just say that I'm no more under the law. I'm under grace. Under grace means I just say sorry, I'll, 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 I'll be forgiven. No, it's, that's not grace. That's a disgrace. You see, the word of God is very clear. What do you mean by intentional sin? That means I will carry on offending God but all I have to say is, sorry, at the 11th hour. Do you know that this is a common idea among most Christians? But God says, if you had planned it all, so that at the 11th hour you say sorry, then there is no forgiveness. You're going to be surprised. That is very clearly brought out in Leviticus. So God says, intentional sin, you plan it all along, you try to uh, take advantage of God's grace, then sorry. That is not grace. No grace will be extended. Okay, so what are some of the common things that uh, we enhance through our lives? A deception, a lives of deception. We say, Jesus loves me. Ah, don't worry, Jesus loves me. He'll never send me to hell, uh, no matter how I live. Is that so? This passage says no. Oh, but I know my Bible. My Bible, uh, uh, I know everything in the Bible. Are you sure you know everything in the Bible? Uh, nobody knows everything in the Bible. Oh, I have an advantage because I'm a Christian. No, in living a life of sin, there's no advantage. We are all the same. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Or earlier on, my sins enhance God's glory and grace. 
you know, sin abounds, grace can also. That means the more I sin, the more God can got chance to show me grace. Have you ever heard this statement? The more I sin, the more grace God got a chance to show. I'm doing God a favor by sinning. So when the Bible says, after all, the Bible says the more sin, more grace. That's not what he means. He means that the more sin you have to face against others, there will be more grace for you to overcome. That's what it means. And then, many theologians don't believe. Earlier on we mentioned. Some say, I don't believe. So, I will not end up in hell. Is that so? There are many theologians, famous ones, who doesn't believe that they will end up in hell. But just because they say God is love, what? So earlier on in the first three chapters, God is talking about his wrath. But now God is swinging. You notice here in this passage, there is God didn't have any word of condemnation. He was just trying to share his heartbeat with us so that uh, so that uh, we need to know we are all under the law. We are subject to the law. And, uh, and uh, we are all guilty before God. Christian or non-Christian. We are all guilty before God. That's why we need to take time, like we paused this morning, to confess our sins. Because we have offended God. And we seldom think about how God feels about our deceit, deceitful way of living, our godless way of living, God gets offended. He's angry. But here he's switching uh, posture. He's now more sharing his heartbeat. He wish there, are, there, is, there is someone who will be righteous, someone who will do good, someone who will seek to understand his heartbeat Someone who will seek his face. Will you be that someone? That's how God feels. Let's pray. Take a moment to respond to God because I can only tell you how God feels. But you need to come before the Lord. <clears throat> Based on all that has been listed, this is the time to Repent before the Lord because it says that God's goodness uh, is to lead us to repentance. Have we been very, very insensitive to God's heartbeat, to God's feelings, to the offense that we commit against Him by the way we treat Him? And if so, how do you intend to change? Are you going to make time to seek His face? What is the change in response to God's feelings? If you feel that, Lord, I want to be the one that will seek you. Just tell him. The Spirit of God has spoken to you. You need to repent of every deceitfulness, whether by words or by life. This is a time you can just confess your sin. What about your family? If you are a father, are you able to demonstrate God's goodness by your words, by your actions, whether it be cursing or cruel, cruelty in, in, in the things that come out of your mouth, or is it something to do with... Um, deceit, 
or cheating. If this is what you repent of, just tell the Lord that. Okay, if you have done so, maybe you stand for the benediction. Shall we all stand for closing prayer? So, Father in heaven, we know you are a holy God. You are an angry God because of godlessness. But Lord, we also know that you are a God who wants us to understand how you feel. So that, Lord, you are not a God who is distant. You are a God who wants us close to you. To seek you, to love you, to walk with you, to understand you. Uh, Lord, most of us don't understand much. Forgive us, Lord, that we sometimes treat you as if you don't even exist. But all of us who have made a decision this morning that will seek your face, that will put you first, that will honor you and glorify you and uh, seek immortality uh, in, in eternal life. Lord, will you just bless us to be a... I bless the families here represented every father and mother here who are striving to be a, 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 a witness for you at home and in the neighborhood. Lord, uh, will you just prosper each one? I speak success to every father here who seeks to impart fatherly kindness to their children uh, in the midst of heavy work schedules and uh, responsibilities. Lord, Will you just prosper them, uh, pour forth your your guidance, your so that Lord, when uh, the children look at them, they know yes, my father do represent my heavenly father. So Lord, will you enable every one of us to truly be uh, by our good works glorify you, Father in heaven. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.